So I'd like to introduce Jeremy Cowan, who's going to talk about the SARE project, Capacity Building and Urban Food Systems at KSU. So uh, what is urban ag? Hopefully this isn't a new concept for anybody, but urban agriculture is basically everything that has to do with growing food, fiber, and energy type products uh, within the urban landscape, urban and peri-urban. Um, most growers, let's rephrase that, most of the agricultural products that are grown in, for the urban environment are actually grown in the peri-urban region, uh, which is the area around about. Let me throw up a definition there. So urban agriculture, the production of agricultural products within the city or densely populated community, whereas peri-urban would be production of those products by farmers specifically for those kind of regions, but not necessarily within those regions. Usually they're within close proximity, but not necessarily always the case. And uh, it's typically a pretty diverse group of participants, regardless of which uh, location we're talking about. So uh, what is an urban food system? Um, I've got a couple slides here to talk about that. This first one just shows that we're not just looking at production. Uh, we're also looking at distribution, public health, um, community development, a lot of the different steps along the way as well, and on the way out. So waste streams, that, that would also be part of the urban food system. Uh, in preparing for a grant application on another project that we're doing together, uh, we came up with this graphic, which is trying to show where the relationships are between the various um, components of sustainability and or the food system interact. So uh, you'll notice that there's three different economic tags. Uh, that's because the economics interact between all of the different phases. So within the urban core, the peri-urban and the rural, the economics, uh, basically you're buying and selling between each of those different um, locations. Um, so things like urban will help uh, build or support the resilience of the rural um, education. Some of the peri-urban folks are coming into town for that or vice versa, depending on what kind of education we're looking for. So things like agricultural education, extension type work may or may not be in the urban environment. And if it is, you'll have farmers coming in from the rural or peri-urban regions to uh, do that. And then uh, I would guess that we should probably put social through all of them because there will be social interactions amongst all of the locations as well. Um, one of the things to consider though, and the reason why rural is added on here is, is because there's a lot of products that you're not gonna find producible in the urban region or just wouldn't be practical to produce in the urban region. Um, and so we bring in the rural as well for those products that are not conducive to the urban or peri-urban areas. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of economic opportunity in local and urban food systems these days, everywhere from food production to distribution, policy and advocacy, education, uh, urban planning and architecture, uh, municipal jobs. So the consumer demand for local food across the country is currently estimated around 20 billion, um, which is not a small number. And it's estimated that there could be as much as $177 million in unmet demand in the Kansas City region alone. Uh, and that's because about 92% of all the fruits and vegetables that are consumed in the area are imported from not just other places in the country, but around the world. And according to the 2010 census, 80% of the U.S. population is urban. Even in Kansas, 2.1 million of the 2.8 million total uh, citizens of Kansas live in towns and cities. Um, I'm not sure what the population cutoff is on that, but it's going to be less than the urban number of 50,000. Uh, we have plenty of grassroots food movements here in Kansas, again, most in Kansas City. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure if any are here from outside of Kansas City. So, nope, we're just focusing on the Kansas City ones here. And uh, 
while this is obviously not a comprehensive list, even for Kansas City, uh, it does show that there are a number of organizations that are involved in the Kansas City uh, food system and other larger metropolitan areas would have similar groups, though maybe fewer or more, depending on how big or well-developed that local food system is. So uh, the project that I'm going to be reporting on was designed specifically as training for urban ag educators. So this is a professional development grant program, uh, professional development program grant. Uh, and those grants are specifically to designed for creating projects that are like train the trainer types. So uh, we're not going out to end users with this uh, project so much as to agricultural professionals. And I think I've got a slide that talks about that a little bit more. So uh, we had four objectives. One was to expand on our gaining ground uh, program and uh, build out a webinar series for that. We wanted to also provide support for our ongoing urban food system symposium, which is a semi-annual. Is that every two years or is that biannual? Always forget. So it's the every other year. <laughs> Uh, urban Food System Symposium. And uh, in the case of the last two, it was to support a pre-symposium workshop, and I'll talk about those, and then to support our Urban Ag Study Tour. So we have grad students in our Urban Food Systems program, and uh, that's because we have both a graduate uh, degree, a Master's of Science in Horticulture with an emphasis in Urban Food Systems. Me. Uh, and a certificate in urban food systems, graduate certificate in urban food systems for those who aren't majoring in our urban food systems program. Uh, and those students were recruited not only to help deliver this project, but also to help prepare and write the grant for it. In fact, they did uh, quite a bit of work on a pre-proposal survey that helped inform some of that. So, um, I mentioned that we have both a master's degree and a graduate certificate. That master's degree is a pretty typical 30 credits to 36 credits, depending on whether it's a thesis option, uh, report option, or, or professional track. Um, and the graduate certificate is a 12 credit certificate with, I want to say it's got six or eight, I think it's six uh, required courses, and then the rest are um, elective. And these are our core UFS faculty. By core UFS faculty, I'm meaning those who are actively part of the day-to-day -day operations in the urban food systems academic program. We have a larger group, um, the Urban Food Systems Initiative, which incorporates a lot more campus-based faculty uh, in a much wider range of fields. And we try to prepare our students for a number of different career fields. And among those career fields, uh, we've had students land in all of these different areas. So uh, project management, food production, uh, although Amanda at the center of the picture there says, if you plan on farming, you don't need a master's. Uh, but we'll still take people who want one. Uh, nonprofit management, food aggregation. We've had uh, students that have graduated, gone on to be organic inspectors, state ag agents, and things like that. Uh, as far as who our ag educators are, this is our target market for this PGP grant, meaning that we're looking at trying to train extension agents, NRCS uh, staff, not nonprofit employees, municipalities, uh, school teachers, community college educators, and um, others who aren't necessarily actively farming, but the ones that are educating farmers or at least lending them ha a hand. So I mentioned that our students did a survey. They were able to pull in over 80 responses of the those, you can see the breakdown, a uh, small proportion were farmers. 84% um, of those that responded were from a metropolitan or urban region, and 77.5% were working within the north central region. So if you're not, is everybody familiar with SARE and how their regions work? So effectively, the north central region, I believe, starts at Kansas and heads north, 
and captures the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, Illinois. I don't know, does it catch Indiana as well? Ohio as well, okay. Um, is it 13 states? 12. Uh, anyways, so when applying for SARE funding and support, you would apply for it within the region that you are in. And here, like I said, we're in North Central. Uh, and so the topics that were identified as being needed by the respondents included business management, access to capital, marketing, processing, post-harvest handling, integrated pest management, soil health, value-added products. Value-added products has popped up quite a bit lately. Um, and so this is what we decided we would focus our webinars on were these topics that were listed by our survey respondents. But 2020 uh, turned things on its head. Um, we submitted this proposal in April of 2019 with all sorts of plans in mind that were related to that. And COVID had its impact on the world. Uh, the death of George Floyd had its impact on the world. And the uh, subsequent movements that came out of that uh, furthered that impact. And so we had to, we, we had to do a big pivot. Uh, and that was because in 2020, we were set to give our next urban food system symposium. Uh, everything went virtual from conferences to classes. And so we weren't able to do a lot of things the way that we anticipated. Uh, we did get a bit of an extension to get things going and uh, permission as it were to change things up a bit. Uh, and so what we did was we pivoted our um, well, let me start with the gaining ground. So uh, gaining ground was gonna be easy because it was a webinar series, right? And people don't have to show up to webinars uh, in masks or socially distanced. And so we were able to put those on uh, and all of those were uh, both delivered online as well as archived. And we recruited the students to run the whole show. So not only did they identify the speakers as part of classwork, uh, but then they coordinated the entire webinar series from start to finish with a little bit of help for the uh, um, uh, the details and getting things connected. But they also then emceed each of those webinars. And so not only uh, did they integrate themselves in the delivery, but um, they were almost solely responsible for its success. And, and it was a success. So. With the webinar series, we were able to produce 10 quarterly webinars featuring all of these topics, uh, Zooming for Urban Agriculture, as though we all needed help with Zooming after 2020. Uh, and so, like I said, they chose and coordinated all the speakers, organized and delivered the webinars. And with over 1,200 registrants, we actually had over 800 participants among those 10 webinars. And that I think it's a pretty good number from my, where I'm sitting. Uh, as far as the Urban Food System Symposium, so this was a, a program that we started back in 2016. Uh, in 2018, we uh, offloaded the hosting to Minnesota. Uh, 2020, it was coming back to us, and uh, 2020 was when everything shut down. And so we had to make a hard pivot on that. And where we were supposed to be doing in person, I believe in June, and we ended up opting for a virtual conference that we pushed back to October just for all of the rigmarole of shifting things around. Um, so this PGP grant provided funding for scholarships for people to attend the conference. And as a result of switching to vir virtual, our costs went way down. And so we were able to provide more scholarships to, to uh, participants uh, and that went over fairly well. Uh, we did have early on in our planning process, some feedback on our topics. And so we were able to be responsive to that with the extra time that we had, specifically looking at some of the demographics for uh, who would be um, featured during the conference. And so we ended up um, yeah, we ended up with a slate of uh, both keynote and invited speakers that ended up being fairly compelling. 
Uh, these are our folks. So uh, Jess Halliday, um, Charles Wright, Chuck Rice from uh, Kansas State, Elizabeth Mitchum, Karen Washington, Jill Clark, Jennifer King, and Mark Winnie. And I'll talk about some of them a little bit more. Um, so with the 2020 Urban Food System Symposium, we were able to um, provide 47 scholarships to our urban ag educators. We had 112 abstracts from 70 different organizations. We gave an additional 11 scholarships to students, and it wound up with a total of 324 attendees that came from as far as New Zealand, South Africa, Switzerland. Uh, we had a much more international conference as a result of going virtual. Uh, I mentioned we did a pre-symposium workshop, and this was another one that was mostly organized by the grad students. Um, and our panelists included Mark Winnie, her, uh, Beth Lowe Smith, Misty Jimerson, and Winona Bynum. And the focus was pr uh, especially on um, food policy councils uh, and mobilizing the community food system especially in the era of COVID and the racial struggles that erupted with, um, that were bought, brought to the fore with George Floyd's death. So the workshop, we had over 120 participants, including our speakers, and 72% of them said that they would re recommend that workshop to a colleague. 65% um, had previously worked to advance food policy councils in their communities. Uh, and 20% more who said that they plan to uh, do something with food policy councils after the workshop. Um, and 80% said they strongly agreed that the workshop improved their knowledge and understanding of food policy councils. So good results there. In 2022, we were able to have an in-person symposium. Uh, this one we brought because we couldn't do 2020 in Kansas City, we did 2022 in Kansas City and provided scholarships for our urban ag educators up to $500 uh, to cover both travel and uh, registration. And we were able to augment the uh, regional grant that we had with additional state PDP dollars. Um, so we had some great speakers that talked to us about uh, the topic of the conference, let me go back there, is building coalitions for a changing world. Is that showing up over here? It's not. Come on, mouse. Here it goes. Building coalitions for a changing world. Uh, and so we were not just talking about uh, some of the social changes, but also climate change. We had a fairly broad uh, set of workshops, or not workshops, sorry, but sessions uh, building on those different topics. And so we had... Pandora Thomas is a permaculture educator out of California that did our keynote. We had other invited speakers, Anurangarajan from Cornell, Samina Raja, and Cameron Smith were all talking to us about different ways that we could uh, collaborate in building our food systems. We had that Symposium at the Hotel Kansas City, which is an old boutique hotel in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. It had quite the decor made for the elegant symposium. Um, it was really kind of posh. Um, although the rooms that we had had really creepy paintings in them. Uh, yeah. So we also had another pre-symposium workshop this time, Cornell and Dr. Rangarajan were the ones that uh, put that on looking at developing curricula to advance planning policy.